What's up, fellas? Not much, man. Yeah. Just uh, our humor this morning. It was like pretty intellectually stimulating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we bring it highbrow. <laughs> <laughs> mm. it was highbrow humor yeah what's going on with you the deepest thing i've contemplated so far this morning is whoever yeah just thinking of highbrow things whoever designed gummy vitamins mm. it's amazing because mm -hmm. i i was thinking about this i got up early i was praying this morning before this and I was like, man, I get to start my day with gummy bears yeah, and say that it's good for me, like it's important. Right, they're candy. Right. That's the deepest thing I've thought about so far today. Monica told me that they don't have iron in them because A, I think it's hard to dissolve iron in a gummy and B, because it's like one of the vitamins or nutrients that you can overdose on. Um, I assume that's how you pronounce it, overdose. <laughs> Over overdose. <laughs> I I said it that way. Um, and you easily, easily could OD on gummy vitamins because they are candy. They it's are. like eating gummy bears. Especially for kiddos. Think about that. They I've been trying to eat, eat less sugar in the new year because I realize I've, I've fallen into that habit of eating a lot of sugar, especially at night. And the other night I was just like, I'd had it and I just needed some. So I went and got some ice cream and some gummy bears and had a thing of ice cream and then almost the whole thing of gummy bears. <laughs> and I thought, I thought, maybe I'll polish it off with some vitamins. <laughs> <laughs> just turn this night around. Right. <laughs> Get healthy. Yeah, it is a great invention. That, because they're even better than the Flintstones vitamins. And those were. Those were pretty Those tasty. Were okay, but they were kind of chalky. They were like bad sweet tarts. They were a little chalky. They were. I'd eat them. I love I love those Flintstone vitamins, though. Mm -hmm. They kind of give you a tang in your mouth. That it, it covers it, your it the powderness of it covers your tongue, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. This, I, which means I would just have to eat three bowls of Lucky Charms, mm -hmm. and I you could really taste the third bowl. Yeah, but those first two it was cleansing the palate. I've always been, since I was a kid, I've always been of the mindset that I want to take big bites or big sips because I want it to like flood my taste buds, you know, like people who kind of nibble, especially good tasting stuff. Like I want a full, it feels like you never get a full dose of it, you know, um, like I, I never got to drink pop really growing up except at one cousin's house that had tons of Coke all the time. So I'd go over Pepsi or whatever. And I would just guzzle it because like, it just felt so good that it hit your throat with the bubbles and it kind of hurt in a good way. And you'd get oh, just yeah. like flooded with sugar. Oh, totally, dude. But people would just like sip them. Like, ugh, it's like what a waste. It, I mean, it would last longer, but it just didn't. It felt like you just had a really long, lame Pepsi instead of one quick, awesome one. Huh. That is interesting, dude. Because I remember growing up, when we would go to like the fair and things like this, I would observe how my other brothers ate cotton candy. And like I would observe them doing it over time, which means that they weren't eating the cotton candy like yeah. I was. <laughs> no, exactly. I, we are kindred spirits in that way. Like why is it? It's why so do you true. Have that? <laughs> but I was, there was a tinge of jealousy. Mm -hmm, like five they still seconds had after I got my cotton candy mm -hmm. and subsequently it was gone. They had it for like 10 minutes, mm -hmm. but I would devour the cotton candy. Yeah. And I remember thinking like one, either they're not into cotton candy like I am or two, um, like they don't know how to do this. <laughs> right. Or like funnel cake was the same thing. I would devour funnel cake. Yeah. Well, I, I think I've always been all at once. Uh, like maybe like you, Mike, a monotasker. This is a Art of Mandalus podcast the other day. A monotasker. As opposed to a multitasker. Yes. Um, I will just like, this is what I'm doing now. I'm eating the cotton candy. I'm not riding rides or looking at anything or listening to you talk. I'm eating this. 
Just like just one second. <laughs> okay, where were we? I, that was. <laughs> where are we? <laughs> no, it's true, but I never saw it as a virtue. Like this is a. I'm not using the thing correctly. I always saw it as like a misuse. That you were it misusing like it. That I was misusing it. Hmm. Yeah, like you should have savored the the cotton candy. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Wait, the way that you're describing is like, no, this is how you need to drink Coke. Like well, it's almost the way that makes sense yourself. Yeah. I feel like, Rob, you probably fall on the other end of this, don't you? It depends. No, not with everything. I devour ice cream. Like, I'll just, yeah, it's, it's the same, <laughs> same thing. It's like, it was kind of when I learned it about myself, it was like an embarrassing trait because, you know, go out for ice cream with people or whatever. And even like, <laughs> Yeah, other people that like ice cream. I mean, they'd have like a quarter of theirs gone. I'd, I'd be done. I'd be like tossing it. Be like, ooh, like maybe I should harness this ravenous a little bit, you know, <laughs> like just for social etiquette. Um, but I don't know. Well, it does raise the question of what is what does it mean to savor? Because yeah. that was yeah. kind of the point of the monotasking podcast was that by multitasking, you're you're not savoring anything you're not doing any one thing really at all you're you're kind of like hopping from thing to thing um yeah that's interesting i i kind of thought about it in terms of what i was thinking of i mean I, i'm sure you guys have always ex experienced this but i think we experienced this with like meals in france when we were on that trip Mets, but like yeah the times i've been in um in italy and there's been meals here of that's a cool experience to be out to like a good dinner and have it take like four hours and like legitimately not realize it be like whoa that was that was like a long time that we sat there and there was something like really good about that so to the question of like how do you save her i almost frame it in the that experience of like how did that happen you know i don't have an mm -hmm. answer there but there's a definite like there's a definite art to it for sure um, yeah yeah which has the quality of like the timelessness which is because you're you're so indulged in the present in a in a good way um yeah but that's hard to that's hard to achieve well um because it's not always necessarily about the things that's there like i think those dining experiences is a combination of the goods of creation acting as a type of uh i don't know help or context that like awesome relationships and awesome conversation takes place and you get caught up into that and i mean the epitome is that it's got to be um babette's feast right which is is kind of a an artistic depiction of it where they totally get caught up in the moment and they say they're able to savor creation in front of them um that's that movie where everybody gets really hammered. All these Puritans start drinking the vino and turns out they love it. Well, that's a, that's the difference between like what's what is Babette's Feast? What makes Babette's Feast different than a binge drinking or yeah. Uh, yeah, just binging in general on cotton candy. Right. Hypothetically. And or I think, even that's true. Like the Netflix thing, binging true. in general. I think that binging is, um, well, what I think Babette's Feast is, and I've never seen the movie, so here's my commentary on it. Connor, you got to see that movie, I know. Dude. We can watch it at the hang. We'll oh, watch it when we hang. That's a great idea. We'll that's cook a, really a big dinner idea. and watch it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Spoiler alert, she dies. <laughs> <laughs> she, doesn't, she doesn't actually... No, no, that's nice, not true. Dude. No, no, that's spoiler. <laughs> that doesn't. She doesn't. Don't worry. <laughs> but maybe you never know. Is that a spoiler when you say she doesn't die? Yeah, no. like whole, the whole time you're kind of thinking maybe she will. And they told me on the podcast <laughs> like, that she doesn't. Like a cooking movie, and you're expecting her to die. <laughs> no, I'm. I was thinking of uh, peepers, leisure as the basis of culture. That that to me is sort of a framework for understanding how to enjoy the goods of the earth um, in an ordered way, which is what makes leisure leisure is that it is worship. Basically, it's open to God. 
it's an affirmation of the good of creation for the sake of the creator because the creator is good and he loves us and so here we are and he wants us to enjoy stuff but um when it becomes binging or just any sort of disordered use of created goods idolatry whatever um it's when it's closed off from that it's like it's not in obedience to the divine will it's not in celebration it's simply it's not open it's not social it's not generous or creative it's it's just like consuming you know like uh scott harder called it pizza love you know you don't love god mary uh, your parents your spouse your siblings the way that you love oreos or pizza because the way you love oreos and pizza is that you destroy them um out of your own selfishness and and desire for them whereas those other people persons you love by holding them in reverence and and serving them um so what's the you know how do you actually enjoy pizza then in a way that's not just selfish i don't know like when it's ingredient in this bigger thing of like i am part of i don't know what i'm saying but i I did eat too many gummy bears the other night and i wonder about this like how it gummy bears are not bad god wants me to have gummy bears but i just know like if i give up one thing because i'm fixated on it and it doesn't make me happy i'll stop it and be like that's sucking my joy i need to just like cordon that off so i can nurture some joy and like read a good book or make a phone call and then i'm too lazy to do that so i just go buy gummy bears and <laughs> it's not leisure it's uh it's something else it's selfish right it's right right, right. it's, just it's something to... yeah I, i'm trying to think back to the peeper stuff too because there's something with like how you order it honestly you know like just the memories of watching movies in in the cam room and the amount of just like junk food I would mm-hmm. consume in doing that. Wow. But, but that was right and just, man. Like that <laughs> was leisure yeah. at the time. And um, so I don't know. There's something to do with like how it's ordered there. I'm blanking on the, the peeper stuff um, this morning. I think it's good. Anyway, you got any thoughts, Mets? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's so true, man. We all got close to getting diabetes on the cam <laughs> from how much candy we ate we had an altar of snack rifice <laughs> <laughs> i never heard where we that. would just leave oh maybe that was after your time but all you the must excessive, have made that up after i left yeah the the extra junk food that we had from cam night we would put out on the altar of snack rifice especially when is, you had a big deacon class because deacons had more money and so you would just oh like i mean if we hosted cam night it would be it would be exuberant Mm-hmm. Like that would be the word. Yeah. And maybe for the listener, Rob, can you maybe just explain like what that would look like? What the altar of sacrifice? Well, not the altar, but the actual movie going experience in the cam room. Well, cam amidst... night is, was a weekly meeting. We would start with an actual like evening prayer and then meeting, which we can't speak about, but then always watch a movie. And we would always one... watch a movie. A movie will be watched. Yep, uh, picked, <laughs> picked by one particular dog on on the cam. And we would, I mean, so there'd be like, you know, 15 guys piled into this, you know, room. No social distancing. Um, <laughs> and <clears throat> we would just watch a movie. But then we had a, a coffee table that would be, it would be piled high with... Just think of any junk food and it's there. Multiple packs of Oreos, licorice, multiple cans of cheese whiz. So much cheese yeah. whiz. Sodas. Yeah, you name it. It's there. It was peanut no butter M and M's, I remember. That's where I started peanut eating. Peanut butter those. M big bags of big peanut room. butter M and M's. Huge bags of peanut butter M and M's. Cookies, chips. You know, it's uh, funny we talk about this because we have had a few retrospectives in the last few weeks, but <laughs> after movie night was when we would stay up, the three of us, and usually talk about the movie a little bit and then just about life and priesthood and make jokes. And that after one of those movie nights is when I suggested we do a podcast. Wow, that's right. I yeah. remember it. Was it, it, was it 
Pacific Rim? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> That'd be that funny to inspired. look back and see maybe what movie it was. I, d- I doubt there's any way to do that. We didn't take a log or anything. Yeah. Well, I to to kind of get us back on on track of asking that question of uh, it, this isn't necessarily the peeper stuff, but I, I think it is in the same vein is that the, in order to be open to the divine will, um, like God mediates his love and his goodness through creation, which means that the creation has to be properly ordered upwards towards God. And, uh, I mean, like drinking is a good example because it's so easy to, it, it, it's such a great good, but it could be such a horrible evil as well if if it's misused. And that looks like taking the good itself and usually using it in isolation in order to move downwards in your humanity and into like a type of, yeah, I would say isolation and darkness, which is a, a move away from relationship. But, but then you can also uh, properly order it to higher goods, which is like you shared in relationship with other people. It brings you into deeper communion, which then those relationships can bring you into like the broader relationship of God. And, and so I, I think it does have to be properly ordered in the hierarchy of goods um, so that it's not the highest good itself, but it, it certainly can be that almost like sacramental stepping stone uh, upwards, but then it seems like anytime that I misuse the good, it's like, it's all about the good. It's just the good itself. And mm-hmm. it's not actually integrated into the hierarchical structure of the good of creation, which, which leads up and opens. That's that openness up to God there. Um, so I, yeah, I think it's important that it's, it's properly ordered inside yeah. and nested in inside of other goods. And there does have to, oh, go ahead. Well, that's that Cam Knight experience. It's a sharing, it's an animalistic (laughs) breaking of bread and peanut butter M&Ms, but like to share in fraternity. That's really what it was about. But if somebody came in and was just like, okay, I'm going to watch this movie, but really it's all about the candy. That's an (laughs) inversion of it. That's true. (laughs) You know? Yeah. I have friends so I can eat candy. Well, and there's also, it's kind of interesting to think there has to be even, I would argue this with like Cam Night or like a really, really good um, dinner is somewhere of like, there there has to be a discipline to it. And I think Peeper would say, like remembering on, on Peeper's stuff of like, Peeper w- would say like for, I think he's actually talking about festivity, which is a prerequisite for like true leisure you have to have um he might even call it wastefulness like you have to be like like actually giving something up in order for festival to to really be possible so you you could be working but you're choosing not to like that's how i would think about Mm. about that but uh like i was um struck i don't know if i'll pronounce this right but it's my favorite restaurant i've ever been to in rome i think it's called the bruzzi and it's like it was still it's i really the food incredible and um it was like one of those big long dinners kind of like a babette's feast experience like everybody's just happy after this four-hour meal but it's fascinating because there it's i think it's a relatively popular restaurant certainly well well known enough for us to go there but they don't like there's no second seatings at their tables so if you get a table in their restaurant, it's just yours for the evening. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so... Like one of those chef's tables restaurants. Is that Have a you thing? seen that series on Netflix? Mm-hmm. It's all these like Michelin star type of places. And that, that's how it is. Like you're basically like the guest for the night. I, I, but I think that's... It, places like that, that's just like the common practice there. So we get there when it opens, which is like 7.30 or something like that. And then it's just you eat it's like multiple courses, and then at the like once the food is done and the desserts come, they just put like the digestivos, the like the after dinner 
drinks. They just put the bottles on the table and like you can sit there and and like joke and laugh for the rest of of the evening. But the table is yours when like you get there <clears throat> and it's do they let you smoke? I don't think so. Unfortunately. Mm. Yeah, I know that would be amazing. I didn't ask though. Um, but at Cam Night, there was there was a very real discipline around it of like you got a test tomorrow too bad like get in there and watch the start of this movie mm -hmm. you know yeah you had to wait uh, till the end of the credits at least yeah leave. um anyway that's that's just an interesting thing of uh, because you can you can over you can swing on that as well and and like quote unquote force fun you know totally always is awful and lame so that's i think that's an aspect of peeper and i i think he he calls he he has he says that there's a um there's a requirement of some form of wastefulness like not in it like non-responsibility but to say i could be working and i'm not here mm -hmm. in order for leisure to be possible can i take you down like a five minute path i just my brain just kind of <clears throat> Are you making connections, dude? Do you have a flow chart? Synthesizing in my brains or... Do it. Yeah. Do the syn synthesis. Jump in, man. Well, I'm thinking about uh, this book I've been reading, the, the es Eschatology, Ratzinger's Eschatology, and um, the whole notion of death and what happens after you die. When you like look at the Old Testament, um, there was this idea of the underworld, Sheol, the shadowy kind of like half-life, non-life that people fell into. Um, like there's, there's a, you continue to exist, but in a very attenuated form. Um, but you were cut off from the land of the living. You couldn't praise God. That's like what, what the uh, stuff in the Psalms is all about. Like why, you know, don't let us die because then we can't praise you. We can't worship you. Um, we're cut off. And that what he says is kind of a demythologizing of like the ancient religions, which is that your ancestor ancestor worship was really like what religion was in a lot of ways. Um, and that you're, you know, dying, you continue to be very present in ghosts and demons and what and whatnot. So the, the Old Testament, the um, Israelite religion is sort of like saying, no, you're cut off like to to be in communion with God is to be alive and death is a moving away from communion with God. Um, you don't become a God by being, by dying. And so that can be read as saying like, you know, that it was almost like a, yeah, just a demythologizing disenchanting religion. Um, but what's really cool is that he, he he talks about it for, uh, in the context of the New Testament, because by the time of Jesus, you had the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the whole debate about resurrection. And, um, you know, the Sadducees were, were much more of this in disenchanted and like, this is all there is, you know, God exists. It's not where, like we're atheists, but you know, nothing happens when you die, which is kind of interesting. A, a post-Christian modern world is like the main thing about being Christian is that, or religious is that you think, you, you know, dying is eternal life or you, when you die, you go to heaven, which is not a given in in religion, even biblical religion. But the big insight he says is that, and you see this in one of the Psalms, like where even in death I can praise you. Like you start to see in later uh, Old Testament writings, the this like flash of insight that even in death we can be in communion with God, and uh, and that there's something, there's some love that is stronger than death. And that's basically, you know, in Jesus, the incarnation, the death, passion, resurrection, um, is that uh, that's the way death is conquered is that there is, it becomes the place where love, communion with the Father is most intimate because it's like the, it's total obedience. You become be obedient even unto death. So there's no sense of like where death was this slow decay and moving away from God and other people until you're just, you know, like you're isolated, you're sick, your life is empty, you're crying out in ag agony, and then you just go into the shadowy Sheol and who knows what happens to you. You're wait, waiting for the Messiah, I guess, to this place where, where now post-resurrection by dying, 
death becomes a place where we draw life from because it's the death of Jesus. We're baptized. We're, we belong to it. Um, and so actually, as you die, you become more connected, more in communion with the source of life, who is God. Um, and so in the context of what we're talking about, I'm thinking about like the gummy bears, like I'm, what it is, is, is in me a refusal to die, you know, like, and this is any of our addictions or attachments, especially bodily ones, but also like you said, Netflix or, you know, you can treat people like, a, like addictions, um, or relationships is where you, you're just like, I'm not going to die here. I'm, I'm, there's some aspect of existence here, human life that is hard and it would be easier for me to just grasp at life, grasp at the tree, you know, when I'm actually called to die, which would be paradoxically the way to open my hands and receive what God wants to give me right now. But I've just cut myself, which is why we always, at least I always feel kind of empty after I am filled with sugar. Um, and this is the last connection, you know, that the destiny then is communion with God in heaven. And Tim gave this nice talk last night um, for we do this Catholicism 101 series every couple, every couple of weeks in the coffee shop on Rublev's uh, Trinity icon. And I'm looking right now at Joanna Hughes icon of the three dogs. Uh, I have it behind the computer here. Um, actually, I could pull it up since we have a YouTube channel. This is our Trinity. <laughs> See, <you're in> light. <clears throat> Mike, you're the one with the Georgia peaches growing up behind you. <laughs> I, I haven't given that thing an inspection there for a little while. I'll, I'll, I'll send you guys it. a picture of it. I need um, to pray with it. I'll send Megan a picture too so she can post it. It's so um, beautiful. It's, but it's, how in the Trinity icon, if you haven't seen it, Google it, Rublev Trinity. Um, you know, he talked about all these cool details of what, what it means that the father is on the left and the spirit and the son are, their heads are bowed to him. And, um, the son is in the middle in this like chalice shape. He's the sacrifice, but on the table, you, you see this chalice that is the sacrifice. Um, and they're sharing, they're sitting around this table. And the, the last thing you mentioned that I've been thinking about is, um, the fourth seat at the table is you, is the viewer you know, the one looking at the icon, um, it sort of like draws you in because there's an empty space around this four sided table and it's on our side. And that's kind of the point of an icon is that it's a window into heaven, but it's also like heaven looking at you. Um, and that's what all of us are called to do is sit at the table. Like when you're talking about Babat's feast, I was, or your, uh, thing in, in Rome. Yeah. A four hour dinner after which you don't, it's like time didn't exist or like it didn't feel short, but it didn't feel long. It just felt like I wasn't thinking about time. I was in communion and uh, it's not like every death that is a way to communion is like suffering and, um, but you, you do kind of die into something larger than you and you, you don't think about yourself. You're not as self-conscious. You're not as much thinking like, what am I getting done right now? Or is, am I important? It's just like, this is beautiful and life-giving and wholesome. And this is very cool to me to think of heaven as sitting at the table with the Trinity forever. Yeah. That's nice synthesis. Yeah. Because it's and the reason that hits so deep of like, that's certainly present at a really nice restaurant in Rome, but I experienced the same thing like when we were in Haiti and we were in the basement kitchen of the Missionaries of Charity compound and Martha Griswold was cooking macaroni and cheese from a box and we would just like sit around and joke and there was this sense of like like timelessness and yeah, kind of a window into a, what I hope eternity will be. So I've never framed it as like there's a death there, but maybe a fuller understanding of, of death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's definitely something about <clears throat> getting caught up into something more, which is, yeah, like a death to self so that you can become a part of this body that's that's sharing in something greater. And yeah, the um, 
Can, can you say a little bit more about the death with the gummy bears? I got to yeah. go in three minutes, by the way. Okay, oh, I'll be real yeah. quick. I mean, guess what, what I'm thinking is like, um, there's a sense of like, I, we are all dying. We all have this, yeah, this tendency towards death and, and we're reminded of that and we rebel against it, which is the grasping. And I'm going to fill myself with life by grasping at whatever. And it just can't be done. It's like a re- rebellion against nature. It's a rebellion against non-being. Um, and only by receiving life, which requires me to like give that up and die to this desire to live so that I actually may live. Um, one of the things that I, I thought of was um, Mundelein. I, re- I really love the dinners when we would have like a Christmas dinner or a you know, celebrating the acolytes being instituted or whatever, you know, like we'd have those fancy dinners and then there'd be an apron on one of the chairs at every table. And I saw Ben Hass do it. He like, when I was in pre-theology, he went to a table and just grabbed an apron. He sat down and like, instead of that being the last chair to get taken because nobody wants to be the waiter, he chose it as the first chair. And I just started doing it at every meal after that. And cause I didn't want to be the waiter. I hate that. Like, Getting instead of like sitting and eating and enjoying the meal and talking with people, you have to keep getting up and go get the food and take people's dishes. And but it always made it more enjoyable because it was like a, a little death to self, where this meal wasn't about me trying to get all of the good time and good food. It became like the the good time and the good food was the occasion to give of myself to the other. That's just like a little example. Yeah. I mean, it may be overstating it, but it's like, that's a part of why it isn't delightful anymore. What you mentioned, like, I don't feel joyful after I eat a whole bag of gummy bears. Because you guys aren't there. Because (laughs) 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 never eat gummy bears alone, kids. Uh, Because it's like you're, it's a type of misuse of them. Mm -hmm. You're, You're not actually enjoying them for what they are. You're trying to make them more than they are. And they're just not capable of it. So it's always going to leave you empty and gummy bears headless Mm -hmm. that's a fact (laughs) that's that's always happens it always happens oh man but but if you eat gummy bears with friends you get to get caught up into the heavens i don't bite their heads off they just become a technicolor mush in my organs oh that's a t-shirt name or band name (laughs) technicolor mush mush in my organs um <laughs> i wish we can i gotta go but i wish yeah i'm actually preaching this lord on, this weekend on the psalm of the precepts of the lord rejoice the heart hmm. so this is fitting goldfish it's the snack that smiles back until you bite their heads off <laughs> <laughs> all right guys see ya peace out see you dudes